Um, when you have uh, existing, considering existing buildings and retrofitting existing buildings, yeah. uh, what are the most um, important aspects of the technologies that you're talking about here that you would suggest for those yeah. kind of projects? So again, so that's that's the the other area we're starting to work more and more on. It's kind of like again, we, you know, we figure new buildings. Yeah, we got that one figured out. Existing buildings, yeah, a lot a lot tougher if you like. But certainly, we've seen the same thing on that commissioning side. So typically, when we're getting involved in existing buildings, um, the the standard approach, if you have an existing building, is they say, oh, we're going to go and do an energy audit, and and we've kind of soured on those a little bit. I mean, they're useful. But they're one step, and we've seen too many projects just sort of stop. We did the energy audit, we got the study, we put it on the shelf, uh, we don't do anything. What we've been doing is saying we want to, we're going to combine the energy audit with recommissioning, because guaranteed that 25% that I talked about, and Urban talked, you know, 15 to 20% of his, guaranteed every building, there's that 20% savings we can get for no cost. We just got to find out where it is. And that's where the, the recommissioning will go out and, and find that. So we tend to, to couple those. So right off the bat, we can, we can do 20%. Then, but if you like, the harder work comes of then looking for these technologies. Lighting is, tends to be a big one and, and so on. Uh, so going to your point about reducing the transportation footprint, rather than putting like behavioral incentives, have you tried uh, in any of your projects engineering things that would uh, facilitate cycling more like indoor lockups or showers? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't show that. So in our office, but we have both uh, bike lockers as opposed to, I'm, I'm not a big fan of bike racks. I think that's, that's, a, that's a cheat. Uh, usually bike racks are empty and bicycles are strewn about uh, corridors and lobbies and everywhere, everywhere but the bike racks, okay? I think in our climate, you need a, a bicycle locker that's protected the elements. So we have bicycle lockers and as well, we have shower facilities uh, in our building so that you can then bicycle to work and take a shower. So uh, that's what we've done. That's, uh, yeah. Um, this goes back to the first question. I might have missed it, but how hard is it in uh, existing buildings to put in those, those sensors that uh, control the lighting and the uh, emission? Yeah, so yeah, I, I think after you do recommissioning, lighting is usually the, the next, uh, or may want to, want to speak to this, um, the, the next easy target. So typically, if you're going to an older building, it's going to be T12 technology. Um, Fluorescent lighting technology has really improved over the last 10 and 15 years, so they're uh, extremely efficient. Uh, and as well, of course, LED is, is the one that's sort of the, the one that's coming on the market. Not, not quite yet there, but, but pretty darn close. So, um, so once you're going and retrofitting the lighting, you would then want to put in the occupancy sensors, the daylighting sensors. I mentioned the, the DALI system, which is a very intriguing system, which gives you full control of that. So that would be number two. I don't know, Urban? 20% just do the energy, the monitoring of the building. 20% for free. The only thing you need to do is not down how much energy you use. That is number one. Mm. Yeah. It doesn't cost you anything. The only thing you have to do is just plug the holes. You know yeah. there's a hole, you know that something is going wrong. Plug it, <coughs> fix it. Like you turned off the, the, the ventilation system that was running 24-7. Yeah. doesn't cost you anything. So you can get 20% for nothing, and that's every single building in, in North America. That's a lot okay. of energy. Anything else? Anybody yeah. else? Yeah. Thank you. So you're measuring your uh, energy use in kilowatt hours per meter squared. Yes. Uh, so does that incorporate uh, what occupancy of electricity use per meter squared? Yes, that's, that's all, all, all in, all energy. So. Uh, kid, I'm per, per year. Yeah. 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 Uh, is there any natural gas in No, no, we're a, we're a gas free building. So, so and, and I mean, that was a, kind of an interesting Sorry, I, I cut that part short, but I talked about the perimeter heating. So, we had initially looked at putting in perimeter heating uh, as a way of just sort of getting the, the, the chill off it. And that's where, again, we got this peer review done. And, and, um, we have the heat pumps. We wanted to use the variable uh, refrigerant flow heat pumps. Now, they're in essence air source heat pumps. And what happens is the colder the outdoor air temperature, their performance really, really starts to, to die. Okay? And so what ends up happening is you say, well, gee, I'm going to have to put in a really big system because the performance on the coldest day of the year when I need my most heat is when they're performing at their first. So we thought the only way we're going to get this technology to work is to put in some perimeter heating, which was going to be run on, on natural gas. Again, we had this peer review done, and, and the, 
the fellow that did the peer review went and challenged us. He says, you know what, I'll bet if you put in uh, darn good windows and you spent some time air sealing your building to get ventilation loads down, he says, I, I think those heat pumps could, could probably do it. And so again, we went back, did our numbers, did our calculations and concluded that. So we said, okay, so let's get rid of the perimeter heating. So that saved us, uh, it was almost between two and $300,000 in cost. And then we said, well, I'm only using gas for heating my water for my lab faucets. So wh that doesn't make sense. So, I mean, because normally I don't like using electricity just to, to generate heat. It, it's not a very good use of electricity. But then we said, well, hold on. If I do the uh, heat pump, getting the waste heat from the server, I'm getting it pretty efficiently and then I only need the top up. So then we actually said, well, if I'm not doing the water heating, I don't need the gas service at all. So we saved another $100,000 by not even having to bring the gas service in. So you started adding up all of these cost savings and uh, it was, you know, it ended up, we were saving a lot of money for not putting it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, yeah. Yes. So let me, let me, I didn't say this, but let me correct one thing. So we actually have what we call vacancy sensors, not occupancy sensors. So if you want the lights on in your office, three things have, have to happen. So uh, number one is they're on daylighting sensors. So if the sun is up, the daylighting sensor is going to shut your light off. Okay. Second is you have to be in there. The occupancy sensor is, says you got to be in there to turn it on. And number three, there's a switch, an on-off switch. So if you want to turn your lights on, you have to physically get up and go over and, and turn the, the switch on. If you leave, the occupancy sensor will, will turn it off. So it's, um, it's sort of manual on, automatic off. So, and, and we think that's, it, it's hard to monitor the savings there, but we actually think it's pretty significant because there's a lot of people uh, they just put in the occupancy sensors and a lot of times the lights turn on and people say, well, I don't really need the lights on, but I got to get up and flick the switch to turn it off and people are lazy and, and won't do that. So, but, so that's, that's that. But back to the ventilation is, so uh, again, typically we have, uh, I don't know if you saw, we have six uh, energy recovery ventilators. Uh, well, actually we have more than that, but the building's essentially divided into six zones in the building. If one person shows up, in that zone, that will kick on that system. And we don't have ventilation per workstation. I mean, we have the, the nozzles, but in terms of fans, we've got six fans serving those zones. So the first person that comes in will actually turn the system on. And so, uh, you know, when do you need your most ventilation is when the space is full. So you got the first person coming in. The, the other thing, of course, is why do I need the, the fan on? So, so typically, your, your fan is, is doing two things. It's getting rid of contaminants, from people, uh, we breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2, so we gotta get rid of that, plus body odors and so on. So if there's nobody there, there's no odor, so we're not worried about that. The second one is to get rid of any kind of contaminants from the furniture that's in there. So, uh, I mean, the big one was formaldehyde from wood products, um, uh, VOCs from a lot of the carpets and so on. So we chose to use all low off gassing materials in there so that when you come in you don't get that sort of stale smell in there of all these chemicals in there. So uh, I'm not overly concerned and I, I wouldn't say I've noticed that you walk in and, and it's stuffy or anything like that. There was, there was no contaminants in there to, to, to flush out. Again, if you design your building wrong and you've got formaldehyde laced wood in there and, and toxic this and that, yeah, you know, the, a lot of the plastics, PVCs, when, yeah, I mean, you got to get that stuff out. And so typically, again, conventional engineering practice is, oh, because I put the wrong materials in there, I have to start my ventilation system an hour or two below to flush that out. Well, again, wrong, wrong solution. Get rid of the chemicals that were the problem in the first place. Yeah, now we do, I mean, it does go into setback mode. So you can, if you, 
if you came in on uh, the weekend, or, or for that matter, the first person in, the building will be a little cool for that person. We only set it back a couple of degrees. First person in, the system comes on within 15 minutes, it's up to temperature. It's 90, 99% we're happy, right? Remember that? Yeah. Okay. No, and, and, and we joke, but seriously, that's, you know, ask the people. They're, they're the ones that decide. Yeah, so uh, there's not an awful lot of salvage materials. Uh, Keyswaters is one that I can, I can think of. Uh, so, I mean, they, they used to be called demolition firms, and now they're called salvage yards or recycling centers and, you know, the Habitat Restore and so on. They've rebranded themselves. So um, there is some of that. Uh, there's not an awful lot of salvage materials. And so part of what we were trying to do is, you know, in our own small way, start to create a, a, a market for that. And, and so uh, it's... I always joke, when, when you uh, pick up, and I dare say you pick up the, the, the drawings and specifications for this building, I can guarantee probably on the first page of the architectural spec, it'll say, all materials shall be uh, new and free of defects, okay? <laughs> so we just cross that sentence out, all materials shall be old and full of defects, okay? <laughs> so um, it, again, I, I mean, and a lot of this is, is cultural. And, and I, I read an interesting article, I'm going to go way off tangent here, but I think this is key. Uh, beautiful article about sort of consumer behavior and so on. And they were talking about the plastic garbage bag. I'm sorry, not uh, garbage bag. The plastic bags we get at the grocery store. Okay, so you guys are all, it's not like this is, this is a new story. It's only in the last couple of years, okay? Go back four or five years, you go to the grocery store and you buy, you know, eggs and milk and bread. They would automatically get your stuff, put it in a bag and give it to you. If they said to you, would you like your stuff in a bag, your immediate reaction is, I paid for these groceries, you put them in a bag, right? Okay, and, and so the, the, the clerk would just never ask you, okay? Now, as soon as we charged a nickel, and frankly, whether it was a nickel or a penny or a dollar didn't matter, the culture changed, and, and the clerk is now doing you a favor. Would you like to spend a nickel on the bag? And of course, in most cases, you say, well, no, I don't really need it. Uh, not only that, the person in front of you have brought, has brought their little Zares uh, cloth bags in there and you're feeling really bad because you didn't bring yours. So you say, no, that's okay, I can, I can, I can carry them out of here, right? So the whole culture has changed from one of sort of I need it or, or I deserve it or I'm worth it to getting it to no, really, I, I don't want it at all. And I think it sort of goes to the same thing about lighting and ventilation and heating. We've set up this culture of, of, of what we want, and I think we've got to start redefining uh, that. To go back to the electric gas question, how yep. do you handle the, the primary energy versus site energy yep. in a province that's actually kind of got very polluting electricity? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a tough one. The interesting that's thing is, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so if you go back to Green on the Grand, the one we did in 1995, we were, so, so just get everybody on the same page. So I, I cheated a bit, I got, I've been caught out. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I gave our energy use in kilowatt hours per square meter, which is called uh, at site. In other words, I'm measuring, I'm reading the meter on the outside of our building. Of course, that's not, where the energy is being used. I gotta follow that wire back and eventually on the electricity side, I'll, I'll end up at a power plant. And that power plant, at least most power plants are running at about 30% efficient. So they will use 100 units of energy to produce 30. So, uh, and that's where, that's called source energy. So what a number of people have done is taken, you take electricity and you say, well, I'm gonna multiply your electricity use by three to account for the fact that really you cheated a bit because some of the energy was, was back produced at the power plant. Gas, the, the multiplier in gas is very small because frankly, you just drill a hole in the ground and the stuff comes gushing out, okay? We gotta transport it, but it, it's fairly small. So when we had done uh, Green on the Grand, we were very much concerned about this site, site versus source and we tried to in, in fact do an all gas building uh, so it was gas heating, and we'd actually done gas cooling using an absorption chiller and uh, keeping the story very short. Uh, we were, uh, it, what is it, bleeding edge? Uh, or what, what, what's, what's past bleeding edge? Yeah, yeah, we got cut. We, got, we, got, we bled really poorly or really bad. Uh, technology didn't work very well, and we had to switch back to an electric chiller, but that was very much on our thought. Is we want to be concerned going all the way back. So. We certainly had the same concern, and when we started the design, we had no pre preconceived notions of that we wanted a, quote, all-electric building. 
But when we looked at it, you know, again, I think the example of, of the water heater I gave is, yeah, we could have brought the gas line in for the water heater, but you, you go all the way through it and it just didn't, it didn't make sense. So. The, the interesting thing, so we've, we've obviously run this building through the Energy Star database, and the Energy Star database does take your electricity use, multiply it by three. Now, for most buildings, lights, cooling, everybody's going to get tarred with that same times three. It's really only, only on the heating side where we pick up. So we end up, we're, we're in the 99th percentile. I don't, I'm, I'm suspicious. I don't think you can actually get the 100th percentile. I think if you're I think you're maxed out at the, so even though I, I accept your point that on source energy, our energy use is higher, but even using source energy, we're still in the 99th percentile. So um, I think we're okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was just wondering if you have any uh, aspects of, like um, if you consider or plan for uh, deconstruction or modular building at all? Uh, interesting question. So this is, uh, in fact, I wrote an article on that one too. So um, uh, there's, uh, among the architectural community, they say, well, look, if we're talking about minimizing energy, there's the energy used by the building, and then there's the energy used to make all the materials that go into your building. And you, you get into these arguments, well, gee, um, insulation saves energy, but I had to use energy to make the insulation. Am I ahead of the game? Right? I, I could actually be losing energy hand over fist by trying to save it. Okay? That, that goes the argument. So some studies have been done to look at this, and I'm, I'm going by memory. I'll, I'll be off a little bit, but, but the premise is the same. The amount of energy used in the materials represents about two or three years of operating energy. So given that a building is going to be around for at least 30, 40, or 50 years, the operating energy swamps the energy used in the materials. That's not saying to be wasteful there, but let's not get into this game of, well, I didn't put insulation in because it requires energy to make the insulation. Bad, bad investment decision, okay? So generally, you're gonna try to get that uh, operating energy as, as, as low as possible. So did we look at decommissioning or, or, or the deconstructability? To be honest, not really, and, and part of it was that. Now, we have done some projects where to the particular owner that, that was important. Uh, Mountain Equipment Co-op would, would be a good one if you, if you ever go to there and see that. They tend to build wood frame structures, bolted connections, so it, it could be um, uh, you know, de disassembled, if you like, so. Yeah, yeah, so that, again, ties very much into this, uh, it's called the embodied energy of material. So the embodied energy includes the energy to make the material as well as the energy to transport it to, to where you are. And so actually under lead, there's, there's points associated with doing that. And so we score, I can't remember the number, we, we scored very high under that credit. Having said that, uh, I think its uh, value is overweighted in, in the system, again. If I can get a really energy efficient heating system from Japan, uh, I'm pretty darn sure I'm ahead of the game uh, shipping it all the way across the ocean to, to, to get it here. I'm not saying to ignore it, but I'm saying just make sure you keep it in context. Yeah. Yeah. This might be a little bit outside the scope, but it really is very much to um, these two questions. Are there embodied emissions that are factored into the um, the greenhouse gas inventory that are done by, say, yourself or other companies. Um, when, they're, when they're building an inventory, say, a building, are, are the body emissions factored into that inventory? Uh, so you, you can do it. So there, there are programs where you can say, I used so many tons of concrete and so much PVC and steel and so on, and it will spit out. Uh, you know, if you follow all those materials back, how much... Uh, well, a greenhouse gases, how much uh, water, yeah, all of those things. So, so you, can, you can do that. Um, the program's called Athena, a uh, great program. We did not use it to do this. Uh, again, you, you, it takes an awful lot of time and effort to do that. And at the end of the day, at least whenever we've done it, because you, you get into these big debates, should I build my building out of concrete, steel, or wood? And at the end of the day, when you go through it all, the difference between the three of them and, and the various emissions is, is fairly modest. And so I tend to find there's much more important things. I'm, I'm not discounting their work. I think it's great work that they do, but um, we, we don't use it much. Oh, and there's no. So there's, they're just doing operating energy. So it's your uh, utility use. Obviously, transportation is operating, and then when they say it, when I said materials, it's the paper for our photocopiers and, and that sort of stuff that we track.
we think it's pretty typical to everyone. I, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting, I, I have this, uh, this little joke I use is, um, you know, generally in the sort of commercial construction, everything comes down to cost. They say, oh, you know, that's all they care about is cost. And so I say, well, since you're so concerned about cost, I've got a great value proposition for you. You should go into the house building construction, okay? And we all know that an operable window costs more than a fixed window. So build your house all out of fixed windows. And in fact, you know, windows cost more than walls. So don't put any windows in. You'll have the cheapest house on the street. You'll make money hand over fist, right? No one's taken me up on this yet, I, I might add. But, but see, there's the point, is because it's the consumer that has the, the money in their hand, they look at that and say, I'm not gonna live in that thing, I'll pay the more money. When we get into commercial construction, all of a sudden we've done a disconnect between the people that are in it and the people that are paying for it. And that gets back to that whole about designing it for people and productivity and so on. So um, I think the more, and that's why I think this occupant survey is, is, is really important. So that owners and, and uh, building operators and so on, uh, you know, presidents and CEOs can see what this really means. And so I think that's a big part of it. Now, that didn't answer your question at all. Um, and I've forgotten the... Um, Oh, for hotels, sorry, yeah. So the thing I'm saying about hotels, guess what? Hotels kind of got this too, because hotels, you, I mean, how many times have you got into a hotel room and it doesn't have a window, right? You know, we got a great uh, interior uh, hotel room for you, right? We do it for office buildings, we don't do it for hotels. So I'm just saying, so hotels, because they know they're in the selling business, realize they don't have to do that. Sorry, that was a tangent. Uh, so in essence, I mean, the technology is gonna vary when you move from building type to building type. Um, but when you go and look at energy use of hotels, it, it's on par with office buildings. It's not that far apart. Most buildings tend to be in that, you know, normal buildings in that sort of 300, 400 range. Hospitals are about twice that number. They would be the one outlier. Data centers would be another outlier. But all the rest are about in that same range. Really, it, it's all the same uh, technologies uh, that are in there. So there's no reason you couldn't uh, use them. Yep. I know it's maybe a little hard to measure, but like, has that uh, company culture permeate to the employees right away the, the, their energy bill, right? Yes. I know that's hard yeah. to say, right? Yeah. But do you feel that actually it's changing the way in their own houses, right? Yeah. I, well, I, I briefly went through that green incentive program, so I, I don't know if you caught on there, we actually have incentives for the people's individual houses. So if you make an energy retrofit to your house, we'll match, I mean the government canceled the program, but we, we match the government contribution as just part of our service. You're taking part of it. Yeah, now, the other thing I, I will say, talk about, this is kind of like that, the uh, grocery bag thing again. So again, we give incentives for hybrid vehicles, we have preferred parking spots. If you have a hybrid vehicle, you can park by the front door and so on. So one of our employees, their car had to go into the repair shop and they had to borrow dad's car to come to work. Well, dad drove the Escalade, right? So puts it in the, <laughs> he puts it in the parking lot. Somebody else from it goes and takes a picture of his car and puts it in the kitchen. And it was like, you know, uh, world killer, baby killer, you know, this sort of thing. So needless to say, that's the last time he borrowed dad's car to go to work. So uh, yeah, so it's... It, there's some of that there, so. Yeah.